Today's readings are all about prophets. And prophets in the Bible are a rather unique breed. For instance, you didn't become a prophet by your own choice. Rather, you were called by God to be a prophet, not unlike someone might discern a vocation to the priesthood or religious life today. And though some prophets in the Bible were treated with due honor and respect during their lifetimes, more often than not, like Jeremiah in his day, they were treated with contempt and only received the honor due them after they died. They tended to be eccentric, curmudgeonly, and somewhat like a gadfly, repeating over and over messages from God that the people and those in authority more often than not did not want to hear. Even at that, they did so out of love. And it was not at all unusual for them to meet a violent death at the hands of the authorities or even the people. The prophet Isaiah, for example, was martyred by being sawed in two. Our notion of what a prophet did is a bit curious as well, for we mistakenly think a prophet spent most of his time predicting the future. Now, without denying that God did indeed reveal the future to his prophets at times, Daniel's visions in the Old Testament and the uh, Apostle John's visions recorded in the New Testament book of Revelation being prominent biblical examples. The vast majority of the time, prophets simply proclaimed truths already known to the people. They called the people to repentance, and they warned them not to depart from the ways of God despite what everyone around them was doing. John the Baptist, whom our Lord called the new Elijah, and the greatest of the prophets was of this kind. He performed no miracles that we know of, but was nevertheless the greatest prophet because he prepared the way of the Lord by calling people to repentance. And prophets also proclaimed the truth in season and out of season. In the gospel today, we saw what happens when truth is proclaimed out of season. The people pivoted instantly from unrestrained admiration to our Lord to a murderous fury because Jesus told them something they didn't want to hear. He reminded them that God's love and favor extends to everyone, to all who have faith and obey his commands, even if they happen to be a widow and a leper from nations despised by the Israelites. The people in the synagogue simply didn't want to be reminded that in the days of the prophets Elijah and Elisha, God provided for and healed foreigners while at the same time punishing Israel for turning to other gods and their disobedience. Now, by virtue of our baptism, all the faithful are priest, prophet, and king. This means we are to proclaim the truth to our culture in season and out of season as well. We're to proclaim the truth in love, yes, as the second reading rightly reminds us. But we're deceiving ourselves if under the pretext of love we fail to proclaim the whole truth God has revealed to us. And it's a happy coincidence that the second reading is one that is read at most weddings. A happy coincidence because the truth I wanted to remind us of today, the truth that as priest, prophet, and king we are called to be witnesses to, to each other and to our culture, is the truth of God's plan for marriage, marital love, and children. Let's start by considering what the essence of marriage is. That is, what is marriage at its core? What makes marriage marriage and nothing else? It is one man and one woman giving each other the total and complete gift of themselves for a lifetime. One man and one woman giving each other the total and complete gift of self for a lifetime. 
All that a spouse is, is given to the other in love. And this gift of self, whole and entire, is received in love. Marriage is nothing less than a covenantal exchange of persons. Now, we would do well not to pass over too quickly the words total and complete, because by God's design, they not only mean exactly what they say, but they also mean it is not within our power to change what the essence of marriage is, the Supreme Court and secular culture notwithstanding. Total and complete means all that is good within the man is being given to the woman, along with all his faults, shortcomings, and flaws. So too for the woman. And by the grace of God, this is what makes the sacrament of marriage sacred and holy. For as part of the sacrament, the couple vows to spend their lives growing in holiness together keeping the good and learning to overcome and set aside the bad. And it is within this sacred bond that God blesses the couple with children, for children are the supreme gift of marriage. And again, by God's design and by his grace, it is within the family that all members of the family are to thrive and grow in holiness. The marital act for its part, is the unique and beautiful expression of love proper to those who have entered into this sacred covenant. It is both an expression of this total and complete self-giving and a renewal of the vows the couple took on their wedding day. It is, again, by God's design, inherently both unitive and procreative. And like marriage itself, this cannot be changed or separated. This is the fundamental reason why contraception is wrong, why it is a sin. For it separates the unitive and procreative aspects of marriage that God has joined together. Furthermore, when contraception is deliberately used, we are no longer totally and completely giving ourselves to our spouse. For our fertility is part of who we are. It is a curious and something thing and something we might spend some time considering. Why it is our fertility is the only part of the body we try to break when it's working as God intended. What does that reveal to us? There is a moral means of spacing births when necessary through NFP, natural family planning. And NFP respects and maintains the unitive and procreative aspects of marital love. Now, the consequences of deliberately separating the unitive and procreative aspects of marriage are profound and devastating. Pope Paul VI, a saint, a heroic pope and prophet of our times enumerated these consequences in his encyclical Humana Vitae. He said that acceptance of contraception would result in an increase in marital infidelity and a general lowering of moral standards. People will be treated more and more with contempt, especially women, and they will be treated as mere objects of gratification. Furthermore, contraception invariably leads to abortion. In 1992, the Supreme Court in Planned Parenthood v. Casey upheld Roe v. Wade based on the fact that people rely on abortion when contraception fails. In his Theology of the Body, Pope St. John Paul II, another modern saint, pope, and prophet, gave us a full and deep exposition of how God works through and perfects nature, how our bodies are not separate from our spiritual life. What we do with our bodies matters and affects our soul, our very person at a very deep level. 
humana vitae, the theology of the body, and information on natural family planning is readily available on the web. And I would, in all sincerity and love, urge you to get and read these in light of what love is, in light of what marriage is, not what our secular culture and the world say they are, but based on what God, the author of life, marriage, and family says. We need to examine whether our hearts have been hardened by our culture, whether we have believed the lie put forth by the so-called wisdom of this world. We're called to be prophets, in season and out of season. Clearly, when it comes to marriage, the family, and contraception, the truth we proclaim is currently out of season. But all this really means is we need to proclaim, live, and bear witness to that truth in love all the more. That's what prophets do.